Hello, hello, welcome back to The Sofa. I hope you guys are having a lovely week. My guest this week is Ian Liam Ward, AKA the King of Chemo. He's an absolute social media sensation and I think the most inspirational person I have ever met. Ian received a shock diagnosis a few years ago that left him with a prognosis of five years. Instead of letting this consume him, he's gone about trying to break as many fundraising records as he can. Ian, in this conversation, takes us through what a diagnosis can teach us about life, how to turn a potential negative into a positive, the importance of having a good old laugh and humour when you're dealing with adversity, and plenty, plenty more. I could have listened to Ian's Irish accent all day. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I enjoyed recording it. Ian, thanks for joining me. Been looking forward to this all day. How are you, mate? Yeah, doing very well. Thanks for having me on. No worries. Let's get straight into it. Um, Ian, can you take us through the events of early 2020 and how these led to you starting the current mission that you are on? So um, I very often have gone in to do um, clinical research trials and use myself as a human guinea pig because they absolutely throw money at you. And for the amount of um, I wouldn't even say work for the amount that you need to tolerate. It's just an unbelievable amount of, uh, of money. And in terms of safety, ah, it's like there may be one case where something went bad during uh, human medical trials. And that accounts for, you know, thousands of medical trials that have actually gone on. It's kind of like how some people are afraid of flying. And apparently it's statistically like the, the safest way to, to travel. And um, medical research probably saved my life because I went in to do a head scan for an MRI and they, because uh, they only accept 100% healthy people and they discovered that I am absolutely not 100% a healthy person and they seen a tumor that was growing in my head and they originally thought it was benign. But after going in for the second scan, uh, they said, no, actually we were wrong. This is growing. This is not benign whatsoever. Uh, this is likely cancer uh well we don't know for certain but it probably is judging by how it's growing and uh they gave me the options uh without question it was um the best option was uh taking surgery as well as going on chemotherapy it'd be the equivalent to someone coming in and being like uh hey do you want toast or do you want toast with butter it's like <laughs> I, I want the second one thanks very much <laughs> And, um, so yeah, I went with chemotherapy and brain surgery and during the brain surgery, they then discovered, yeah, okay, this is cancerous stage three all the way during this, uh, by, um, coincidence by a bit of serendipity. Uh, I had started up a social media channel on YouTube just for playing video games. And then once COVID happened, it was like, oh, this is kind of perfect. Now I have all this free time. And, um, then I got my second scan a little bit after that. So I'd already started up a social media channel and I kind of thought, well, I may as well use this for a different purpose now. Yeah. And I looked up, um, cause I'd done marathons before and I thought, all right, well, if I'm going to do some charity f fundraising, um, let's look at a marathon. Cause I've done marathons before. I know that they, they go hand in hand with, um, raising money for any sort of charity. So I looked up marathon, looked up what the world record was for the marathon. And I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. This is, uh, this works. Let's go with this. Uh, no need to, you know, change it around just because it was the first thing that I thought of doesn't mean that it wasn't, you know, I'm just, uh, a, a fitting like a hand to a glove. So, uh, I've been gone with that the whole way through. And we are now at, I think less than six weeks away from the London marathon. And, while we're only at 2% of the, the world record, I kind of think that with it coming up to the end, you get, I don't know, I don't know percentages, but I kind of feel like far more than, uh, 2% comes in at the very end. I feel like 50% almost comes in at the very last minute. And even down to the, the, the day itself, uh, I still think that because there's a, a deadline, much like an, ass uh, an assignment for a university, everybody like hands them in with one hour until the deadline. And it's like, Jesus, why didn't I just do this a week ago? And <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Like, you need the pressure of the finish nature. line, right? 
Yeah, kind of like that. But I feel like other, uh, like the the viewers uh, are going to be thinking of uh, they'll be of a similar ilk where they'll be like, you know, oh my god, his the, the world record's gonna stop tomorrow. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I haven't donated anything. I've been following his channel, but like, uh, Asher, I'll donate a tenner now. And I feel like there'll be lots and lots of people doing that, especially if it gets to like, hey, we only have twenty five percent more to go donate again because we're this close and we wear it you know a much further away place and now we're here so yeah i'm um uh, realistically hopeful about it yeah well it's, it's inspirational firstly the fact that you know you had this news and quite quickly you were able to turn that into a positive i just want to go back to that point how long did it take you to sort of realize okay i've got this gaming channel i'm gonna go and try and you know, make this potentially negative into something that could be really positive. Originally, when I first was, when it was announced that I was going to have my surgery, uh, one of the risks was that I was going to be losing my ability to speak. And I did lose my ability to speak. It just didn't, uh, it didn't last very long. It was um, back to pretty much 100% by uh, six days. So not even a week. And um, so during the, before the surgery, the first thing that I was thinking of was, all right, uh, if you're going to have brain surgery, you're going to have a scar on the side of your head. At some point, you will also probably have hair loss through chemotherapy. So uh, you may as well just get ahead and address the elephant in the room. And then so I started thinking of I'll do charitable stuff. Um, it's quite common for people who are doing speed runs while playing video games to... Um, to uh, incorporate a charitable element into it or for people to do things like, you know, hey, uh, we're doing this tournament. Um, it's a fiver to watch. Loads of the proceeds are going to uh, a charity. And uh, which is just it's practically basic marketing. So I was just kind of thinking, ah, yeah, there you go. We'll put a bit of good, we'll get a bit of a silver lining out of a, a bad situation that, in my opinion, needs to be addressed. And then when they said, no, it's stage three cancer, it's not the best, it's not the worst, could be stage four, I was just kind of like, well, uh, to hell with this, let's let's crank it all the way up then. If, uh, if cancer is going to, you know, up the ante, let's double down and let's, you know, start playing, um, playing poker against cancer in the, like, you know, reenact the uh, Casino Royale and we just keep putting all the money in and see what happens, see who dies first. So you've got a whopping 2.4 million followers on TikTok, I checked earlier, 15 million likes, God knows how many views, and about 150,000 on Instagram. So you, Yeah, yeah. Well done, firstly. And you've, you've got this goal to sort of beat the world record for raising the most amount of money for the marathon. But just in terms of what's the sort of ultimate long-term vision with the king of chemo? Um, well, one, at some point, I feel like I'm going to have to change the name around both for the fact that I want the channel to become a group thing, much to, have you seen the, uh, the traveling kind of adventure traveling channel? It's called Yes Theory. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's uh, I would imagine I wanted to kind of switch it around a little bit to, uh, not to mimic that exact kind of, um, uh, format, but just, it's a, it's a couple of guys and they all run the channel together. And I kind of wanted my channel to, to go that way as well, where I have multiple people on it because I mean, uh, I'm, uh, in good health at the moment. Well, I mean, I'm not, but I feel like I'm in good health at the moment, which is probably a good indicator of, um, that I'm going to last longer than five years, seeing as how I'm coming up to, um, two years now. So, um, you would think that there'd be some sort of a negative at this point if that uh, was going to come to fruition. But um, I still want to have uh, other people there manning the channel so that if I do die, then it's not just going to sort of stop. It will still have, it'll probably lose a lot of momentum because I imagine that most of the fans, well, all of the fans at this stage have uh, are following exclusively me rather than the idea but um, I'd like to think that the thing that the channel will keep going uh, if I choose the right people, maybe even do even better, like a, like a piece of art. How um, once uh, once the artist dies, the value of the art goes up. Maybe the channel would explode even more so after I pass. But uh, yeah, so I want to do that. Uh, also, the name needs to change. If I haven't been in chemotherapy for a long time, if I haven't <laughs> sure. been in chemotherapy for like five years, it's like mm, maybe I should just say like you know the king of cancer. King of or cancer, something. yeah. Yeah, something like that. 
Um, but in terms of uh, outside of the marathon, oh, the plans are endless, absolutely endless. Like this is um, the marathon. It doesn't matter about the marathon. I'm just never going to stop doing this charity fundraising because I don't know why um, more people haven't been doing this because you basically have creative control to raise all this money and it when people earn money when people want to make a lot of money themselves i don't think they actually care too much about the money i know that there's some people who do but i think more people uh care about success in any form and that's what this is to me it's like you know the chase for uh being the best at something and it, i basically just have uh complete creative control re- within realism like you know i can't post certain videos on social media and um but I, I can just sort of choose what to do. Like, do I want to do it through pub quizzes? Do I want to do it through teaching fitness classes? Do I want to do it through making documentaries for going around the world? Like, you know, there's, there's, um, do I want to like, you know, start taking up the piano? I can't play the piano at all, but like, you know, let's see if I could do it in a year and like start a band. Like there's no limits to how I'm able to, um, to try and attempt to do this. So it's just, it's great to be, 33 and get rewarded for being creative. It's not a common um, uh, job prospect for someone who's my age. Once you're 13, they start stamping down on the creative spark. Making, strengthening the community element and bringing other people in, I think that's a really clever idea. Just to go back to maybe your diagnosis, if, diagnosis, if that's okay, and that must've come as a complete shock being part of a clinical trial. Uh, so you had no symptoms whatsoever. And I've obviously seen the breaking bad news, particularly from the doctor's side, quite a few times, and it's not something you necessarily get used to. But can you just sort of explain what that experience was like? Well, that one wasn't so bad because they said that you are uh, you got a tumor, but it's benign. And then so I was like, all right, well, what does that mean? And they went through it and they started... Uh, the thing that anno- that instantly annoyed me in the, in the moment was that I wasn't able to do the upcoming research trial, which meant that I was going to be... Um, <laughs> Uh, down on cash. money that I was kind of semi expecting, you know, I was making plans for what I was going to do with the cash because it was <laughs> like, you know, once I, once you, once you get accepted, it's like, you just got to pass the medical. And I mean, like if I had no symptoms, uh, it's not hard to think that I was uh, going to be, oh, well I'm in now I've, I've like done the paperwork. Now it's just a matter of, um, you know, that they don't detect a lot of cigarette smoke in my, my lungs, which, you know, I don't smoke, so <laughs> they weren't going to. And, um, yeah, so the money was definitely the first thing that annoyed me. And then the second thing was that, uh, I was joining the, um, reserve army at the time. And I was funnily enough, I actually learned about the reserve army in, um, uh, in a medical trial <laughs> and some guy was just telling me about how his life is just so cool he just like goes to uh goes hiking just does all these sort of outdoor adventure stuff and he gets paid to do it because it's like oh now you have mountaineering experience that goes well on your like sort of soldier cv and then i said to him but like but what happens if you know you get called up and you have to go out to afghanistan and you're basically guarding poppy fields again <laughs> and he was like no as a territory army guy you can refuse you have complete control to refuse going to the army i was like why are they like why would they allow that and i was just like hey, it's just the rules and uh, yeah so i signed up to um uh to the territorial army and then uh, yeah, th- that was one thing that I wasn't allowed. And thinking about it now, actually, with like what's going on in Ukraine, that's almost a little bit annoying because of all the awful wars that have gone on in the last 50 years, that's actually something that, you know, you could get behind and actually like, you know, come up to the, uh, into the war zones and feel like you're actually doing something for, you know, the good of the planet as opposed to you know let's go into iraq why doesn't matter just get in there get in there they've got wmds do they really oh yeah definitely should they they bombed 9-11 <laughs> yeah so yeah that's um, a rant for you isn't it yeah it's it's, it's so good though um and I'm, I'm fascinated by the answer actually because you you have this like infectious positivity and like your attitude 
to life is clearly very positive. And I've asked you a question there, which a lot of people could have gone into quite a deep and sort of dark answer about some of the thoughts that come up when you have a diagnosis or, you know, you hear some bad news, but your answers there are a little bit more, you know, the first one was about sort of losing out on the money. And then the second one is, you know, you can't join the territorial army. They're not necessarily the, the deep core emotions. And I just wonder, that's your ability to think like that about life has probably put you down a really um, positive path in terms of your journey so far. And I wonder if you have any advice for anyone out there about how they can perhaps take some of that positivity from you. Um, I wish I could like have some sort of um, advice with that sort of thing, like training advice. Oh, uh, do what you love, be consistent, because then even if you're, um, you know, not lifting the perfect kind of weight ratio to reps and, uh, size of the weight, if you're constantly doing it and you enjoy it, you'll naturally, um, be more frequent and it'll be more, more habitual and habits are everything. But I don't know what the, I just got lucky. I got very lucky with, uh, my mental health. It seems to be, uh, you know, I, like I don't I don't I meditate but like I still kind of had this attitude before I started meditating to be honest I started meditating to do with um uh craving issues that I have for for sugar so I was just trying to sort my diet out nothing really to do with um uh happiness uh, I I don't know I feel like what I've done now is that uh uh, as I was saying, I just, I, I have a lot of creativity that I get to sort of like taking a breath. I get to, I get to have that creativity. And I think that that is a, uh, something that is directly associated with my own happiness. And I think that it is with, with every person and that the older we get, the less, uh, the less we do it, the less we, uh, play with Lego, the less we just start drawing on things The you know, we all just start kind of doing things more, um, that are a bit mundane and even, you know, when like, uh, why, how many adults quite enjoy building Ikea furniture and especially when it's finished and you can look and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I think that just comes from creativity and building and coming up with ideas. And now where do we put the Ikea shelf, you know, that sort of stuff. And yes, I have recently bought a lot of Ikea furniture. That's <laughs> why <so> it's <laughs> popping around in the mindscape. Um, I guess it's sort of keeping that sort of inner child alive and allowing yourself to not necessarily get constrained by some of the other things that can sort of uh, dampen down, you know, that creativity. I also wonder yeah. you being so positive and keeping that sort of spark alive, how if that may have had some sort of effect on your prognosis so far and how well you are doing. I don't know if you ever think about that sort of the potential within thinking positively about a diagnosis because there is some research out there and there is a lot of thought that the more positive you are about your sort of health outcomes and prognosis then perhaps the better you do you know that link between the mind and the body and I don't know is that something you think about um not with the direct sort of thing of how uh happiness can like sort of I suppose would it be um connected to a lack of stress and therefore uh yeah yeah I would I would imagine um that there's definitely a, a lot of truth to that. But I think for myself, uh, it wouldn't be so much um, for the health part of things, but at the same time, like I do quite, tr uh, I try and focus on um, things to correct my health that if they don't work, they have positive side effects. So uh, like I'm quite into my fasting, um, which, you know, if it doesn't work out for, um, starving the cancer cells because, you know, you switch to ketone bodies as opposed to glucose, then, uh, you know, worst case of the best case scenario, I'll look better. You know, <laughs> that's, that's always everybody's goal. It's always good to have a bit of a six pack, especially if you're, uh, uh heading in towards forties and yeah. So like worst case scenario, at least I'll die with a beautiful corpse. And then, uh, yeah, it's just uh, all those sort of things. So I never feel like I'm cheating out of my own time or that I'm spending money on, uh, some sort of a supplement that's, you know, a complete, um, hack and a scam. Cause you know, if research comes out tomorrow 
And it says CBD oil actually has no benefits whatsoever towards cancer research, as long as it doesn't have a load of research that says it also doesn't do anything else. It doesn't help with sleep. It doesn't help with this. It doesn't help with that. I feel bad for that scenario. But if it's just like, you know, no, it turns out it doesn't help with cancer. It does help you sleep though, you know, then I won't feel regret having started those sort of uh, alternative treatments because um, it's every one of the alternative treatments that I'm doing uh, has some sort of a, a side sidebar um, positive thing for my health, which in the grand scheme of things is still interconnected to what you just said there about how if you're optimistic, you can probably increase the quality of your life or quantity. So yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely a mind-body connection through exactly what you just said there at the start about the stress link, and that will definitely play a role with the immune system. You know, so for infections and cancer, there's going to be a, a net positive effect by being less stressed. Um, if it runs deeper than that, I don't think we really have the science on that. You are clearly a very funny person, already been laughing a lot on this podcast, um, and I find your social media is particularly entertaining. Um, how important is humour for us humans to help us deal with the challenges that life throws our way? Vital. Absolutely <laughs> vital. The Like, I, I would be a huge proponent of uh, anything to do with censorship is, like just straight up wrong that uh if someone is saying something nasty and you can kind of read them that this is not they're not trying to make someone laugh here they're trying to say this to upset that person deliberately i think that's very clear uh for most people and then there's a, a few bad apples that just want to hear anything that could be interpreted as something that is uh, uh, offensive to them. And then so they want to try and wreck the party for everybody else. And I, I'm i just so against that because um, a lot of people use uh, the power of humor uh, to make fun and belittle some of the awful things that have happened in the world. It allows people who can't quite fathom how evil it is to try and put something humorous on there to try and make it sort of something that they can think about or that, you know, makes it a little bit better in their mind. Whether or not that's a right or wrong thing to do is, is you know, a, a completely different question, but I can kind of see where you're going with that. Yeah, so I feel that about um, all things uh, in life. My, my mom was only talking to me uh, yesterday about the, uh, at the funeral of my, my granddad, who was a very well loved person. And uh, my mom, my mom is the eldest of, um, four siblings and so they're up the front and uh, my uncle <laughs> my uncle whispered in her ear you're next <laughs> to, my, to my mother because like the, my uh, my grandmother had died as well so those were both the parents out of the situation my granddaddy was very fat and uh, when I was one of the pallbearers and uh, my uncle was one of the other ones and he started making jokes about like, Jesus, this casket is so heavy, isn't it, lads? Just as well you work in the gym and all that. <laughs> started doing all this about like, good thing you're still playing rugby. And um, yeah, I he did a few other ones like that. He's someone, uh, my, <laughs> my auntie had provided food um, because, I uh, oh, sorry, provided apples because my uh, my grandfather was very much into his orchard and uh so they had apples out the um <laughs> the coffin and then same uncle started making jokes about how if, if he was alive you'd see a hand poking out and grabbing the apples and uh during the actual mass service and so we were here like you know half the half the church was you know bawling crying and here's the you know the the tight family uh, the the nuclear family and we're all here giggling during it so yeah no it's, it's it's a coping mechanism right isn't it and it's to try and just you know make those situations that are the sort of worst situations that you can imagine um yeah a little less painful for everyone involved i love how your uncle was saying those jokes are so good oh yeah yeah he's he's if you think i've got dark humor <laughs> um has your diagnosis shifted your perspective or taught you anything important about life that you didn't really think before um it in a lot of ways no 
but it has given me uh, given me a worthwhile uh, opportunity in life and uh, a worthwhile um, purpose. So I always use the reference of um, the show uh, with uh, Dr. Dre, the Defiant Ones, and one of the first things he says when they're like talking about like you know how um, Dr. Dre started off, and he was like, "Man, I'm so lucky!" Like from from my first memory. It was only music. There was nothing else in my life. It was just music. I didn't have any desire to do anything else other than music. It was just laser focused. And I remember the first time watching that, I was like, oh God, I wish I had that. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just like sort of twiddling my feet. And I'm like, I went to university and I studied something that I enjoy and I enjoyed my job. And I still do. I'm kind of still doing that same job as a fitness instructor. Um, but I also was there thinking like, okay, where is this going? Do you have a goal? Like, is it just going to be same thing for 20 years? Like you do enjoy basically getting paid to do your own workouts, but where is that going to? And I never had uh, an answer. And now I have uh, an endless answer where it, it just doesn't matter about, um, I break the world record for the marathon then I could just break the world record exactly again and do it in a different way. Maybe I'll try and break a different um, charitable world record. Uh, maybe I'll do, just do it for a completely different type of charity. I've done it for cancer research. Now here, here's the next one. Let's try and break my world record. But now I'm doing it for homeless people. Now I'm doing it for mental health. Now I'm doing it for whatever. Maybe I could start my own. I've always had a, a daydream to kind of start my own charity for... Um, uh, uh, after school kids, which is just basically getting a, a, a place where you can show them, uh, how to be creative. Because again, I don't think there's a, a club where you can kind of do that with, with a huge amount of freedom. So like, you know, there's, there's more ideas are coming in for things to do with my life than, uh, I can actually have time to complete. So I'm never going to be, um, unsatisfied or not have a, a a goal that is meaningful in my life anymore and that's that's a beautiful thing to have mm. so often i hear that sort of same story that something big happens in someone's life that then leads them to sort of find their purpose and um, beforehand perhaps they were going through life as uh, a little bit less in a direct manner um and i wonder if there's a way it would be really interesting to find a way to sort of instill that into people without them having to go through these life challenges not everyone hits a life challenge at the right point for them to then be yeah. directed and i guess you actually touched on perhaps what the answer is to that and with the charity you want to set up and that's that instilling more creativity or allowing more creativity for our young people and i think sometimes the school system doesn't allow for that um and i think that's a great idea i, I'm, I wish you the best of luck with the charity because i think you'd absolutely smash it so this series, I've been lucky enough to partner with one of my favorite brands, Heights. In an ideal world, we would all eat a diverse, nutritionally complete diet that ensures we meet all of our nutritional requirements. However, if you're anything like me, you'll know that life likes to get in the way, and that's not always possible. That's where Heights and their Smart Supplement comes in as the best insurance policy for looking after me and my brain. The Smart Supplement consists of just two easy capsules taken every day and has been formulated by neuroscientist Dr. Tara Swar and dietitian Sophie Medlin. The all-vegan capsules are packed with 20 essential vitamins, minerals, antioxidants and healthy fats which are designed to support your brain, nervous system, immune system and even your sleep. I personally noticed an improvement in my focus, boosting my energy levels, I'm more motivated than ever on my goals and I even make it to the gym more often when I take heights. So if you want to get started with brain care, Heights are giving all of my listeners a 15% off your first quarterly subscription with the code Straight Talking. Head to yourheights.com and use the code Straight Talking and start taking care of your brain and body today. Your um, fitness challenges um, all revolve around fitness, funnily enough. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you have any challenges coming up uh, soon? Is it the marathon, the next one? Um, and how important do you think exercise is in regards to our mental health? Um, oh, I think it's incredibly uh, important for our mental health. Uh, I'm stealing this from an ASICS uh, ad, I think, but they have this terrific ad where there's these uh, people walk or running around, and I think it's raining, not that it matters really. And then what you kind of see is these various words that are like sort of coming out of their uh, their skin. 
and it's like stress, worries, problems, and all these sort of things. And then at the end, it says um, uh, running. Uh, sweat isn't the only thing that your body is letting out while you go running. And through that, and then through one of my friends as well, uh, I now have a little sort of, um, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but if ever I have a big problem, a, a big problem, and it's stressing me out loads and it's bothering me a lot, go for a run. And when you come back to the house, if you still have that problem, then it's a big problem. You need to address it in a different form. But if you come back and you don't care anymore, it doesn't matter. You've gotten rid of the problem. You've just gone out, gone for a run. Now the endorphins are floating through you and you kind of have it. You're just in a different mood and therefore you can uh, let go and you're no longer focusing on it. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, my, my, my opinion is that, but that's an anecdotal opinion. There's so much clinical research to say that uh, exercise is brilliant for uh, for stability and mental health. And in terms of what the next events are, there is the Dublin Half Marathon, which is the 17th of September. Then there is the big one, which is the London uh, Full Marathon, which is the 2nd of October. And then there's a CrossFit Games in London uh called battle cancer i'm gonna be doing that and that is in the middle of the october again and then on halloween in ireland where uh the dublin marathon is that's on the 30th and then after that i'm gonna be taking quite a long break until uh the first of january and then i'm going to cycle across the entire coast to coast of america starting from nyc all the way through down Route 66, 66 miles every day until uh, we get to LA on bicycle. So, yeah, lots of stuff coming up. So you're a busy boy. Um, and the, yes, way, the way that you are gathering donations and trying to raise money is a little bit different. You're just trying to get as many followers as possible. Anyone that can donate, great, but you're kind of looking for big sponsors. So BrewDog recently sponsored you. Uh, just quickly, I, I will put the things in the show notes for it's the at the king of chemo, right? On your Instagram and socials and TikTok. Yep. At the king of chemo. Uh, where, like, or the username. Sometimes they don't have the at, but I mean, whatever service you use, whatever social media service you use, that's the one. How does or how, has your cancer affected your training for these challenges? And do you have advice for anyone that has a physical illness that maybe finds it a little bit tough? Um, yeah, so at the during my radiotherapy and in and around my chemo, that was there was definitely like a less significantly less uh, training improvements. It was kind of weird because there was never any big jolt where it was just like, oh my god, now I'm, I'm really feeling it these days. Um, I just kept going out, um, doing my runs or whatever, and there was just no improvement. And then it would get slightly worse. Um, but it'd be getting slightly worse in a weird way because anyone who's into endurance um, sports of any kind know that uh, stopping, learning how to to not to keep going and to not stop, is more of a mental state of a uh, of play or whatever. And so I'd be able to go longer distances but I would be doing it at significantly slower speed. And I know that goes with the, with the territory, the longer you go, the shorter, the uh, slower you are, but my pace would be a lot slower. So let's say if I went 10 kilometers and could do five minutes per kilometer, uh, now I'm doing, uh, 12 and it doesn't feel that difficult, but I'm going up to six minutes per, uh, kilometer, which is a big, big difference in terms of how, uh, of, uh, fitness. Um, so yeah, that got a lot more, more tricky, but I, I felt more comfortable going longer distances. And I think that was just, um, I was able to teach my, rather than train my mind, teach my mind that, uh, the, anything that is incredibly long and difficult to do, you, you kind of push the, the stopping and the giving up option uh, you kind of can put it into the back of your mind a lot more. I think the more you do it, the more you realize it's just one foot in front of the other. 
and you can uh, you can use that so that format in absolutely anything that that's all everything is it's just a thousand small things that equate to one giant thing no matter what it is even if it's like an arm wrestling competition where it's like you know one giant thing in one group or like a powerlifting uh, event the months beforehand are still you getting up in the morning you go into the gym, you lift in the weight one time. Now you rest. Now you lift it again one time. It's just steps, steps, steps. And like Arnold Schwarzenegger said, reps, 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 no matter what it is, you just keep doing it and keep doing it and find the will to uh, do it a third time. And it's it's not about like the screaming pain that you've got to tolerate going through. It's just um, keeping as consistent as possible with whatever it is that you want to achieve. I love that. And I think that that transcends to everything in life, like whether or not you're revising for an exam or, you know, setting up a business or, you know, trying to get through a mental health battle, whatever it is, like you break it down into manageable steps. So you've got your big goal and you've got your outcome that you want at the end, but you need to break it down and just take it step by step and day by day. Um, A good friend of mine says, be impatient with actions and patient with outcomes. So take action. So do those small steps consistently, you know, and, and and do them as often as you can. Don't wait about on them, but then don't rush the outcome. Don't rush the event, um, the, the outcome at the end that you want to achieve. And if you can do that, then you can sort of stay, stay in balance and your mental health usually um, benefits from that. Yeah. Big, big believer in that as well. Uh, especially i know it sounds like a weird uh format for but especially while using um tiktok i think i've learned that a lot because there's a uh because the channel is so big um and because so many videos can get uploaded constantly they have to have a, a robot to uh monitor censorship so uh it gets it wrong it gets it wrong quite a lot and you can get that can be extremely frustrating but um you can still sort of pat yourself on the back by being like, okay, well, I still made that video and I still learned something from making that video. And though it doesn't feel like it's um, satisfying to, you know, have a, have the account frozen because I had a pen in my mouth and it was interpreted as having a cigarette. And that actually happened. Um, I was there like that with a pen in my mouth while I was writing down a piece of paper. And of all the things to be writing down, I was writing down like uh, um, uh, updates for the fitness um, Uh, the fitness book that I have. So I was like, okay, let's see. I did 12 pull-ups today in a row. And like, so I was like, no, 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 no. Okay. (laughs) The date, Uh, let's uh, let's turn over what was my previous. And then it was just like, "Eh, you've uh, illegal use of property. I was like, what, what illegal use of property? I wasn't. And then I just remember the pen was in my mouth. I was like, oh, you gotta be joking me. But I mean, that's pretty funny in hindsight. Of yeah, all the it's a good uh, it's a good story, but and yeah. they need to improve their AI or their bots or whatever they're using on TikTok. So, yeah, I mean, it's not it's not the end of the world, and I kind of know that. Give it a week or uh, or whatever, and then things will be back to normal. So there's no point in getting super upset over it. Yeah, and that perspective is really important. I think anything, and you did allude to it earlier as well, but like with the going for a run. Um, and then seeing how you feel. And that's just, it's doing two things, isn't it? You're doing a bit of exercise, getting the endorphins going, trying to change your your mental state, but it's also giving you that time that you need to sort of reflect on something and trying to be less reactive. And I'm a big, big advocate of trying to find those actionable things that can make you less reactive. Yeah. I've seen through my time as a doctor and just in general life, um, but particularly in my work in medicine, that many patients, when they receive a diagnosis, it can have the negative effect and it means that they perhaps don't live life to the fullest. I feel like your younger self probably was living life pretty much to the fullest and and you've kind of continued on that, if not been even more invigorated since the diagnosis. Um, But do you have any advice for anyone that's really struggling at the moment? Perhaps they've had some bad news, they have a diagnosis and they're not really feeling like they're getting the most out of life. Um, I, just to go back, actually, this sort of reminds me of uh, when you were asking me about uh, what kind of keeps me happy or uh, advice for doing that. Um, this kind of does pair into something uh, is that uh, the people who you are around have a, a, a huge amount of influence on your level of happiness. And so it can seem kind of mean, but anyone who is just like 
I'm not saying uh, remove yourself from your friends who might be suffering from depression. Absolutely not. But there are some people who have mental uh, health issues. And then there are some people who are just like Debbie Downers. And you just got to get rid of those people. They're they're not worthy of your time because um, they are going to bring you down more than bring you up. And the same thing. Uh, I think all human emotions are incredibly contagious. If, uh, if like, uh, there's a reason that in, you know, the, uh, world war, uh, one, that if you ran in the opposite direction to the front line, that you'd be executed for such a thing. And that was because fear is contagious, but that goes two ways where if you're in a comedic, um, an actual live show, and let's say you're looking at, um, Bill Burr, you're, and you were in that actual live show, you'd be laughing 10 times more than watching uh, it on Netflix. So, uh, I've never seen Dave Chappelle live. I would love to every time his Netflix um, specials are on. There's always, even if I'm watching it on my own, I'd still be laughing at it. So, uh, but to to be in the actual circle is completely different because you are around other people that are doing the uh, the same thing. And I know this is probably a bad example, seeing as how uh, cinema is dying at the moment. <laughs> but I think it's the same thing for watching a film when you go and you see it and other people. Um, there's just something about like, uh, getting to enjoy something with, uh, with others in a situation. Although the last time that I was in the cinema, there was someone trying to, to quietly eat a packet of crisps. And everybody knows that if you're trying to eat a packet of crisps quietly, it makes it more noisy and I wanted to kill them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, don't go to the cinema anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that's why it's dying. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. And also it was, um, I think it was it was Dune. Have you seen that film? Yeah. Yeah, so like very, very suitable for the cinema. I think that's one of the few films out there. Batman is another great one like that where it's so built for the cinema, but there's also quite a lot of quiet parts where you kind of have to it draw you in and pay attention to the um to what they're saying. And I remember there's just someone right behind me. I was this close to like just <laughs> getting up and grabbing his crisp well, and just when, throwing it on the ground. When you paid like, you know, whatever the cost is for a cinema ticket these days, then, you know, they're ruining yeah. your experience. It makes it even worse. But just to go back to that question, um, but what, what would you say to those that are maybe not getting the most out of life that they feel like they could? Yes. Uh, well, other than um, being around uh, the, the other people, I think uh, do what you can and don't think that you can't do something until you give it a go. So um, I had a, I still have meniscus damage. And I remember the best physio that I went to was not someone who was like, okay, do this exercise, do that exercise. Uh, what he went with was more of a... Um, uh, an interpretation to how to live life as opposed to, um, he was just like, I've got meniscus damage as well. Uh, unfortunately there's really no, uh, exercises that you can do to help with meniscus damage. But what you can do is you can just sort of think like, what is valuable to you that, uh, you can, um, that you really still want to do. And for me, it was uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and it was touch rugby. And then, so I was like, okay, which one do you, um, prefer? Which one do you feel you're most likely to get hurt in? And then he was going on about how he still plays football, even though he has a meniscus damage himself. And he's like, what I've did, what I've done is I've cut out training with the actual football. I only focus on the matches. When it comes to training, I keep my fitness really high. So it's all stuff that's in a controlled environment. You know, it's not best for me as a player. It certainly isn't. But it means that the thing that creates the most happiness in playing football is on the match. And I'm not using up sort of knee time or whatever way you want to think of it as a uh, training, which would then increase the chance that I won't be able to play the match. So it's all about kind of not, not so much pushing yourself to your limits, but, um, thinking about what is valuable. If you're, if you're going to be boxing yourself into the, into your house all the time, because you think like, you know, oh, I'm worried about my, uh, my arm getting dislocated because I have a weak, you know, a uh, shoulder girdle or whatever. That's not, you're not quite living life like that. You're living cautiously. And I don't think, um, human beings, we're not cautious. We're, we're not a cautious species. There's actually a, a really good documentary on, um, how 
uh, we do not analyze risk accurately in the slightest. And that's actually towards our benefit in the grand scheme of things, because it means that if the people in like, you know, the East coast of Australia and they're running out of food and the chances of them actually getting on the boat and finding New Zealand are incredibly not low. It's like one in 10 people, but people will still take that chance. And because that one tenth of a person or group went off and found New Zealand and then, whoa, you know, loads of people ended up in that country because the, uh, the, those people, all those people took those chances and only one of them was was correct. And I think that that same sort of, um, to be oversensible about the dangers of the world, it just isn't a good way to live life. You have to go out there. You have to take chances. I think that's a great bit of advice. And I think we're very quick as humans to sort of say, no, I can't do that anymore. Uh, and I, trying to make some, you know, taking the time to think about it and then make some alterations to those things that you love so that you can still do them is, yeah, really useful for people. Ian, I always ask this question to round off uh, my podcast. Um, and it is, what is your single most important piece of advice for anyone looking to improve their health and happiness? Uh, consistency and forming habits by a country mile is the most important thing. Uh, and that's, I don't think that is just my opinion that there's so much research to back that up. If you are just doing things and you're practically, everything that we do is pretty much on autopilot. We're 99% of what we do is autopilot in every regard. And if you can imagine that you can do that and you can do that to something that is a positive habit, whether it be uh, first thing you do when you get up in the morning is you brush your teeth like, uh, and it's not, it doesn't become an effort because that's just something that you do. And the same thing for uh, first thing that you do is walk the dog. First thing that you do is go to the gym, all that sort of stuff. It just adds up. And then uh, you, you turn around three months later and you're just like, oh my God, I've written a book. Oh my God. I've like, you know, gotten through university or I've nailed that, as, uh, that assignment. And it is just by forming habits. Um, I am not a huge book reader. I listen to a lot of books, um, but I'm uh, dyslexic and my habit used to be uh, I would read on my commute and I don't have a commute anymore. Um, and one of the books that I used to read or uh, read and reread was, uh, I think it's just called The Truth About Habits or The Power of Habit. And it had this very simple thing of it's like, uh, okay, what's a cue? And this is something that you use for both negative habits and bad habits. It goes both ways where it's like cue, um, action and reward. And it's just all about how you analyze those three uh, things over and over again and see, okay, um, I woke up in the morning. The cue was, um, uh, that there was some sort of uh, gunk on my tongue. So then I went in and I brushed my teeth or I just, I naturally knew that my breath smelled bad and it's just the action is brushing the teeth. And then the reward is, you know, you got this for a second and you say, I oh, am yeah, my teeth are clean now. Um, and that, that you can apply that to absolutely anything in the world. It, you can apply it to smoking cigarettes. You can apply it to, uh, sex. You can apply it to, uh, working out in the gym. You like, you know, it, just find your ways to form habits. It is easy on paper. It's hard to do in real life, but once they start, once you have got it, it's like riding a bike. It tends to stick. And that's the, um, that's the important part about it is that once you're doing it, it's autopilot. You don't have to put the effort in anymore. Yeah, I guess that's why it's so hard to break bad habits as well, you know, for different oh, yeah. reasons as well. But, you know, once they're set in stone, those bad ones are hard to break. But once you get the good ones set in stone, then, you know, you, you do stick to, stick to them. I love consistency. It's one of my four key values. I think it's incredibly important. And if you can first understand those, uh, you know, principles you spoke about, you know, the cue. There's also a book called um, Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he actually adds in another area of that, which is cue and then craving, which is like the feeling that you get, um, which is like another step on that. And once you understand, you know, the bit more of the science behind it, you can sort of hack the system a little bit um, and then put things in place to actually create those habits or break bad habits, depending on what, what your sort of priorities are. Ian, it's been absolutely wonderful. 
completely inspirational. And anyone that doesn't follow the King of Chemo, please go and, and follow. That's the, you know, if even just if we all follow, that's going to be a net positive effect and help him get more donations. But if anyone feels generous and does have the cash, then, you know, get your pennies out for Ian and, and the great cause that he supports. Thanks very much for having me on. No worries. Great to chat.